folks with learning differences and folks on the autism spectrum. And Adria has done a lot of work in terms of educating communities on how they can help. And um, she's got a website, Adria's Village. And here is Adria to tell you all about what she does and, and who she is. Adria, thank you. I suppose I'm supposed to make my way up to the front, so I'm just gonna really quickly pretend that... Okay. Um, thank you, Suzanne, so much for having me. Um, mm -hmm. And as she said, I'm Adria. I'm here today. Everybody can just relax because we're gonna have story hour now, which I'm sure you're familiar with being librarians. Um, I'm here today to tell you uh, what it's like to walk in the shoes of the children and the individuals that you're aiming to serve with this grant, which I am so happy personally that Suzanne was able to secure. Uh, makes me really, really happy. Um, I basically am gonna take you through a timeline of my life and just tell you about my life story, what it was like to grow up um, as me as a child with autism. Well, I wasn't really a child as I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed quite late, actually, with mild autism. Not until I was 20, the summer after my freshman year of college. But um, I always displayed symptoms and tendencies, and they were always there. Uh, as a child, just as a side note, more formally di uh, was called uh, nonverbal learning disability in me. I more uh, met the criteria for that. And I still do, but um, the autism came along later. But uh, as a child, I was described by parents and caregivers and teachers as being very polite, respectful, helpful, very eager child, friendly, um, but didn't always play as in reciprocal play with other children, would share a space with children and play with them. Um, but would often play separately than other children. Like if you have a group of kids in daycare and you have maybe three kids over here playing with Legos and building houses or building a city or whatever you have, I might be the little kid over here in the corner uh, coloring 101 Dalmatians in a coloring book um, or listening to music or looking at a book or something um, to myself. Uh, I also struggled with routine and changes in schedule. I was very much schedule oriented and if something changed I would, I didn't like it. Um, I was very bright, especially with verbal skills. My mom will tell you fondly that if you got me on a subject that I like, I never shut up. <laughs> um, but my parents, my dad is a recently retired um, professor of organic chemistry from IU Southeast. And my mother is still working today. Uh, she's a pediatrician and she actually sees a lot of children on a day-by-day -day basis with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and we were introduced, both my younger sister and I, who is completely, typically developing, uh, Janelle is her name, uh, now in med school. Uh, we were introduced uh, young to books and academics and just the love of knowledge was instilled very young and like for example we would go with a babysitter almost on a weekly basis maybe even more than once a week to hear story hour at the library and we had library cards as young as three and five years old and we would check out books we would look at Dr. Seuss and um, we would read Richard Scarry and we would Chrysanthemum by Kevin Hinkies, we read Owen, um, let's see, Blueberries for Sal, a bunch of them. Um, and every night when my mom came home from patient care, we would rotate who got to pick the storybook. And she'd say, girls, whose turn is it? Go pick the book. And we would run down the hall and uh, pick a book. Eric Carl, Streganona, um, you know, The Very Quiet Cricket, The Magic School Bus. I was read aloud to, to be honest with you, until I was 13 years old. I'm not ashamed to say it. <laughs> uh, I'm a little older than that now, I'm 
28, but often I don't, uh, it doesn't seem to a lot of people that I am. In fact, to this day, I'm still asked on occasion, can I see your high school ID, please? And I'm like, hmm, if time travel's legal, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, so as I said, I was read aloud to for a long time, till I was 13 years old. And the last book my mother ever read me was Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And I actually, I loved it, but I remember getting about halfway through the book and I took it away from her because uh, she just wasn't reading fast enough. And I said, well, darn it, mom, I can read that. I can read faster than me. I'm gonna just get it over with myself. <laughs> and I did, I read it and then my sister read it. And um, yeah, we both read that and until I was 13, I was ready to. And so I think during childhood, young childhood into maybe teen year, early teen years, reading because social skills were difficult and because forming social relationships were difficult, books became um, my entertainment and a way of keeping myself occupied. Um, and then when you get to adolescence and teen years, high school, I was still struggling with social relationships I was um, just not forming relationships as I should, showing very little interest in romantic love, um, not understanding it. Just, I was still displaying um, some concrete signs of autism, um, limited eye contact, repetitive ritualistic interest. Um, in one of my sessions, it was interesting, was Harry Potter for the longest time. <laughs> Um, and so, at this point, I was also experiencing bullying, and I think at this point in my life, reading and academics became an escape from uh, bullying and isolation and loneliness that came with the school environment. When my mom, uh, as I said, is a doctor, and often I would go into her office, you know, as she was finishing up for the day, her coworkers knew me and had known me since I was about, uh, two and a half years old, and she said, Adrian, how are you doing in school year this year? You know, do you like school? How's school going? And I would say, yeah, I like school. I like the academics, but I don't like the kids. And so reading uh, became an escape from the interactions with the kids. Um, and I think as you get on to more present day in college, because I did go to college, I graduated in May of 2010 uh, with a bachelor's degree in English and Spanish from Russia University, which is a small Catholic liberal arts school in Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, and my teachers, uh, my professors, should I say, liked me a lot because I was very, very diligent with academics, often turning in papers and projects weeks before they were due. And they would say to me, I wish I had 10,000 Adrian Nassims. <laughs> and my friends, I was the kid in school that everyone knew, but I didn't have a lot of close friends, but I had, you know, people, a lot of people knew me. And uh, they, my, uh, the kids that, you know, I did see more habitually started giving me a nickname, that nickname being the library rat because I spent so much time in the library and I went there so frequently, almost multiple times a week, if not every day. And um, when, you know, still into college, struggling to maintain social relationships and um, social conversation and uh, pick up on social cues and such. And um, so they, you know, they call me the library rep because while they would be at uh, formal and while they would be at the basketball games, I would be um, sitting in a chair in the library reading articles on autism and developmental disorder and reading Harry Potter or reading Joseph Conrad. Uh, what did he write again? I swear I got an English degree. I just can't remember what he wrote. Uh, Art of Darkness, maybe? Yay! I didn't like that one, but I did read it, I promise. Um, okay, well yeah, reading, when I, should have, when I could have been um, socializing with friends or spending time with friends. Um, and so reading to me at, at this stage in my life became 
uh, something that I did in addition to, or instead of socializing almost, and um, I often studied uh, a lot more than, than I spent time with friends. I would, as I said, do homework a lot more than I would um, participate with friends. But um, one thing reading did for me, and especially this Harry Potter, I said I had an interest in Harry Potter. Um, this Harry Potter interest started at about age 12 because I remember uh, I was in middle school and the first Harry Potter had come out, I was in seventh grade, but it lasted all the way until I graduated college and into young adulthood to the point that the kids at school called me Harry. They would ask me in the hallways, do Dobby, do Dobby, talk like Dobby. You know, when I would. Um, and I think what Harry gave me, what the Harry Potter books gave me, besides this fantastical depiction of this magical world that you could just immerse yourself in, uh, you know, this very enticing to any kid in America or around the world, because who doesn't dream of saying a spell and the light comes on, or saying a spell and, you know, your room's cleaned up, or your homework's done. So it's very enticing to many children, but for me, I think what Harry Potter did was to finally bridge the gap between typical kids and me. And I think for the first time in my life, I wasn't the weird kid. I wasn't the one that they were laughing at. They were finally laughing with me because they realized that I was good at British accents. And they would be like, Adrian, do it again. Do it again. Talk like Harry, talk like Harry. And I'd be like, hello, I'm Harry, sir. Harry Potter, and they'd be like, oh, holy cricket. <laughs> you know, so it, it gave me finally something that I had in common with my friends. And, um, you know, so reading has had a lot of impact on my life, and as well as libraries. Um, I, now I'm out of college, but I'll be honest with you, I go to the public library almost every day, and every staff knows my name, and if I'm not there, they're like, why weren't you here yesterday? Did you are, you, are you sick or something? No, I, no, I just, um, it was snowing, so I didn't come. <laughs> you know, and so going to the library has become part of my daily routine and my daily life. And honestly, if I don't go, it's very off-putting to me. There you go with the routine. Um, but one thing I want to talk to you guys now, now about, besides telling you my life story, is to um, tell you that I've, I've surmounted a lot of obstacles that my parents didn't think would be possible for me. In addition to autism, I also have multiple other diagnoses, including mild cerebral palsy, um, a seizure disorder, anxiety disorder, and a pretty um, severe nonverbal learning disability. And I grew up uh, special ed, K through 12, with regular ed as well, mainstream. But I've been able to do a lot that my parents at one point only hoped for, including now living in a residential neighborhood with only a service dog um, who's trained for mild autism and physical disability um, living with me, and mild you know, supplemental support um, through the community, but basically, yeah, me. I'm doing my laundry, I'm getting my groceries by myself, I'm riding the bus to the movies, um, I'm going out and having dinner with friends and going to see a movie, um, you know, and I'm looking for a job and I'm talking to college classes about my experience with living with disabilities as a kid. So I'm living a full life, but at one point, um, my life may have been very different had it not been for what I call, and what my mother growing up used to say was the, ex or is the expression, it takes a village to raise a child like Adria. You may have heard of the expression, it takes a village. It's an African proverb. And she growing up would say, it takes a village to raise a child like Adria. Meaning a child with special needs, a child with learning differences, a child with exceptionalities, however you'd like to phrase it. 
I like exceptionalities because, um, you know, I'm, you know, and if you put Jeopardy on, I can do quite well, but <laughs> let's not brag, shall we? <laughs> anyway, um, guys, you may think that to, when it comes to kids with special needs, a lot of the, the task does fall to the parent and to the therapist and to the doctors who have their hands on them, shall we say, the most. But I don't believe that. I believe that it is not just the parent and the teacher and the um, doctors and the physicians that work with them. It's not just their responsibility, it's everybody. Because, especially being a library, you don't have just an office. You don't, you don't, and I'm not saying this, if there's teachers here, I don't mean to offend you, I'm sorry. But I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say, you know, you guys don't have a classroom, you don't start your day at 8.15 and end at 3.20. You, um, you are an integral part of the community. And a lot of people think um, when you work with kids with special needs, you have to have some very important title or, you know, you have to be, as I said, have a certain job title, but I think it takes everybody. And it has taken everybody from my parents, both of them, and my sibling, and uh, doctors and therapists, and a dog trainer, and a swim coach, and clergy, and uh, summer camp staff, a whole slew of people to give me my best life. But it also takes librarians. So I want to impress upon you now the opportunity you have and maybe also the obligation that you have to children who maybe in some instances are overlooked, who don't get a lot of attention for the, from the general public and maybe the attention they get sometimes is negative. The opportunity that you have to impact these children's lives and these individuals' lives for the better. You may think, well, I'm only one person, I'm only a librarian, I only know the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> I don't know much about the diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder, what can I do? Well, you can build a village for a child with a disability, with autism. And all it, it doesn't really, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take, you know, superhuman knowledge. It just takes the fact that you reach out your hand and you say, I'm gonna join you and I am going to take this opportunity to meet you where you are and to open my doors and open my heart to you. And I would like to ask you, if you are in this room, this cause must matter to you in, in some, some form. So my question is, you know, I'd like to ask you, where are you gonna put your effort and where are you gonna put your time? You have choices in life and you make them every day, what you wear, what you eat, whether you walk to work, whether you drive. So my last question is, I am now trying to start a consulting company for parents and professionals, as well as pre-professionals who are wanting to work in the special needs field, where I go out and meet with them and tell them my story of growing up with uh, autism and learning disabilities and other special needs uh, and help to make them good providers um, by sharing my story and helping and you know sharing tips about how to work with this population from direct experience. And my question is, I would like to ask you, we have a hashtag that we use when we post anything about what we're doing and that question, that hashtag is, whose village are you building? You build a lot of people's villages. 
but now you have the opportunity to build a village for children and individuals who may be some of the most vulnerable, but also most deserving and most, you know, most, um, I don't know, they're some of the most vulnerable and most deserving um, individuals who need you. So that is my question, is whose village are you really here to build? Thank you.